<clears throat> Welcome everyone. Good morning to those who are gathered here in the sanctuary and to all who are joining online today. We begin this morning with a musical prelude by John Mayhood. Thank you, John. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Charlottesville. My name is Tori Goodlow. My pronouns are she, her, and I am pleased to be leading worship this morning with our guest preacher, Reverend Annie Furster, and musician John Mayhood. This sanctuary was built over 70 years ago on the homeland of the Monacan people and was once cared for by enslaved people from Africa and their descendants. We honor all who've dwelt here and all in our congregation whose lives led to this moment of our gathering. <clears throat> I invite us to take a moment to greet others. Those online may unmute and say hello, and those here in the sanctuary or social hall are welcome to greet your neighbors, especially those you may not know. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Hi there. Hi. Mm -hmm. Everybody staying cool? Mm hmm. Trying to, right? Mm hmm. Morning, y'all. I got my mom with me. Morning. Excellent. Good morning. Hi, Rachel. Mom. We offer a special welcome to newcomers and invite you to join us for fellowship after the service in the social hall. Feel free to use one of our red coffee mugs, which are for newcomers, and UUCville members and friends are reminded to offer a warm welcome to anyone with a red mug. We also invite you to stop by the connections table near the monitor in the social hall where you will find all kinds of interesting information about UUCville. Seating is also available in the social hall where there is a live stream of the service. Everyone is welcome in the sanctuary, but if you need a roomier space, the social hall can be a good option. 
Many thanks to all the folks helping us share worship, both here and online, our greeters, ushers, and hospitality and logistics team, and special thanks to our AV Tech team led by Rachel Buckland, supporting the dual platform worship both online and here on Rugby Road. And now we have greetings from board member Chris Little. Thank you, Tori. Good morning, everyone. Uh, 13 months ago, we all voted to approve a mission statement that emphasized love in action. And about four or five weeks ago, we approved a strategy that really provided more specific guidance for how we as a congregational congregation will live that love in action for the next few years. With the uh, emphasis on a few terms such as BIPOC, anti-racism, justice, partnerships, proximity. And I just want to share a very brief story about how this strategy, which is intended, so the mission defines our purpose. Why do we exist? And the strategy helps us stay on purpose. And I want to share a, a brief story about how the clarity of our mission and our strategy helped me in the last few months uh, find an opportunity uh, that has been very enriching and very healing. Uh, a few months ago, as part of the Tom Tom Festival, Fritz Hudson and I participated in what's called Reentry Day, which is a day that focused on the incarceration system, people in reentry, people on the front end who we would try to help not be incarcerated and so forth. And anticipating the approval of, of, our, of our strategy, which emphasized partnerships and proximity and so forth, Fritz and I participated in a, in a breakout discussion group uh, with other congregational leaders uh, discussing interfaith collaboration. And the upshot of that is that uh, Tim and I got invited to meet with the two of the leaders, the pastor and a board member, at Abundant Life Ministries, which is a, a church uh, on Prospect Avenue, you know, in the projects of Charlottesville. It's not a church with a big steeple. It's really just two very small houses on the street surrounded by a lot of other houses in the community. Uh, and the upshot of that was a few weeks later, Tim and I got an inquiry from the pastor uh, there. If, they had an opening and a need for an adult volunteer for a, for a summer camp for kids aged 10 to 14 for the month of July. And I said, look no further. If you'll have me, I'm your guy. And so for the last two weeks and for the next two weeks, I get to participate five hours a day, uh, four days a week with a bunch of boys ages 10 to ages 10 through 14. Uh, and just get the rich experience that that is bringing to me. And just to, to, to emphasize an example of that rich experience, uh, I'll close out with a short story. On the first day, for me, my first day at camp, all of us were sitting out uh, in front of a, under a tent in front of the White House, as it's called, up on Prospect Avenue, and all these kids are congregating, mostly coming on their bicycles or walking, but a few are getting dropped off. And we're waiting for the bus to take us to where the camp is held during the day. And uh, two kids got out of a car, and because they looked alike, their hairstyles were similar, one of the other kids said, are you guys related? And they said, no, we're not. And being the new kid on the block and the only white kid on the block, I kind of cautiously said, aren't we all related? To which young 13-year-old Zaire responded, in our hearts. Thank you, Chris. Here are our announcements. Rev Tim and Rev Susan are away for the month of July. If you have any question or need, questions or need to contact the church, please email office at uucharlottesville.org. The ministry, ministry for Earth wants everyone to know that if you are planning to t attend the potluck postcard writing party at Penn Park this afternoon, there has been a last minute change. 
Due to the extreme heat, the potluck part has been canceled, but we will still be writing postcards to encourage climate friendly voters from 1 to 2 p.m. It's at Penn Park at shelter number two. Is that right, Ellie? Okay, you're welcome. Another postcard writing session is planned for Saturday, August 3rd, and will be held indoors. Please see Ellie after today's service if you are interested and have questions. Ellie, will you raise your hand? Thank you. All right, please join us in the social hall after the service for coffee and conversation. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me here. I've asked Tori to read the, the call to worship with me. We bid you welcome, who come with weary spirit seeking rest. Who come with troubles who are too much with you, who come hurt or afraid. We bid you welcome, who come with hope in your heart. Who come with anticipation in your step, or who come proud and joyous. We bid you welcome who are seekers of a new faith, who come to probe and explore, who come to learn. We bid you welcome who enter this hall as a homecoming, who have found here room for your spirit, who find in this people a family. Whoever you are, whatever you are, wherever you are on your journey, we bid you welcome. As Anne Salamini lights the flame of our chalice this morning, please join us in saying these unison chalice lighting words. Do you want to say? I don't know those words. Okay. We light this chalice. Oh, sorry. We, <laughs> as people of faith, with joys and sorrows, gifts and needs. We light this beacon of hope, sign of our quest for truth and meaning in celebration of the life we share together. And because I did not know those words, I brought additional words, if you don't mind my saying them. We light the chalice to illuminate the darkness. Come we now out of the darkness of our unknowing and the dusk of our dreaming Come we now into the twilight of our awakening and the reflection of our gathering. Come we now all together. We bring unilluminated our dark caves of doubting. We seek unbedazzled the clear light of understanding. May the sparks of our joining kindle our resolve, brighten our spirits, reflect our love, and unshadow our days. Come we now, enter the dawning. And now we will do our hand motions. We light this chalice to celebrate Unitarian Universalism. This is a church of the open minds. This is a church of the helping hands. This is a church of loving hearts. Please rise in body or spirit and join in singing hymn number 410, Surprised by Joy. Surprised by joy, no song can tell, no thought can come, this here we stand. To celebrate eternal love, to reach for one another's hand. Beyond all other gifts is this best gift alone to mortals give the love of Thank you. 
We are an interconnected community that cares for one another. Part of how we embody this care is by making time each week to share the joys and sorrows we hold in our hearts. There were no joys or sorrows submitted this week. So as is our practice, you are invited to come forward now and place a glass stone in a communal bowl of water as a symbolic act of each being held by the larger love that holds us all. Those online may type their joys and, or sorrows into the chat. Ellen Longmore from our pastoral care team will also come forward to help hold the space. She will be available for a few minutes after the service in the back corner of the sanctuary if you are in need of pastoral support or just need someone to listen. Those worshiping online can contact the pastoral care team at pastoral at uucharlottesville.org. Let us begin our ritual of joys and sorrows. This community offers its love and support to what is closest to our hearts. Another way we show our care for one another is in sharing our financial gifts with our community and our congregation. Our social action collection for the month of July is for the Buck Squad, whose mission is to reduce gun violence in Charlottesville, keeping our community safe. Buck Squad is the only prevention de-escalation program of its kind in the city addressing conflict through violence interruption. Rachel, will you please show us the social action slide for giving for those who would like to make a donation right now. In addition to giving online, if you would like to give today with cash or check, please use the social action collection envelopes here in the sanctuary and place your offering in the collection plate. Along with our social action collection, each week we invite everyone into the spiritual practice of generosity by giving to the ministry of our congregation. Through your pledges and with the weekly Sunday morning offering, together our financial gifts and, su and support sustain our congregation. This is our shared ministry. During the music that follows, you may choose to make your Sunday morning offering by using the text address or going to our website. Here in the sanctuary, you may place cash or checks in the collection plates as they are passed. Let us now dedicate all of the many gifts we share with one another by saying, we accept your gifts with gratitude. May we use them wisely for the highest good.
in a house which becomes a home, one hands down and another takes up the heritage of mind and heart, laughter and tears, musings and deeds. Love, like a carefully loaded ship, crosses the gulf between the generations. Therefore, we do not neglect the ceremonies of our passage when we wed, when we die, when we are blessed with a child, when we depart, when we return, when we plant, and when we harvest. Let us bring up our children. It is not the place of some official to hand to them their heritage. If others impart to our children our knowledge and ideals, they will lose all of us that is wordless and full of wonder. Let us build memories in our children, lest they drag out joyless lives, lest they allow treasures to be lost because they have not been given the keys. You see, we live by things. and We live not by things, but by the meaning of things. It is needful to transmit the passwords from generation to generation. This is a reading called Celebrating Ourselves by Edna M. Ward. Ritual must be grounded in community. Community deepens and sustains the meaning, value, and power of the ritual. In community, we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses to our celebration. A community is necessary if the ritual is to have lasting political power in the wider society. Rituals have to be institutionalized. They can't simply float free, although they may begin that way. The ritual of baptism has lasted because it has a home in the church. The ritual of marriage has lasted for many reasons, but one is that it has a home in both religious and legal institutions. Both rites of passage are grounded somewhere. They become a part of an institution's identity and responsibility. They become part of an institution's legacy. Thank you. Do you kind of get the idea I'm going to talk about ritual today? Well, a few years ago, I bought a new car. I thought it was simply a contract of economics born partly of necessity and partly of lust. I needed to trade in my aging vehicle, and I really wanted that cute red one. You know, don't you, that it takes at least two days to buy a car. There is the day you sign the papers of intention, and then there is the day that you sign even more papers of possession. And in between you worry, am I doing the right thing? All in all, it is an exhausting experience. And while you end up with a new car, you also end up with either debt or diminishment of capital. And you begin, if you're like me, to wonder why anyone would want to buy a new car. So this is exactly what I was feeling on that second day of paper signing. After I had ratified the last document and listened to the last lecture on maintenance, the salesman invited me to walk to the other end of the showroom with him. More papers, I thought. He led me to a large ship's bell and instructed me to pull the rope four times. At that point, I was so used to following his instructions, sign here, initial this, give me your old keys, don't lose this, that I simply did what he said without question. I rang the bell four times. Oh, that bell was loud. Immediately, everyone in the room, everyone, stopped what they were doing, rose from their seats, applauded, and yelled, hurrah! <laughs> At that moment, it was no longer simply a contract of economics. It was a celebration of having bought a new car. A happy warmth rose from my belly into my chest. A smile exploded on my lips, and I raised my hands in joy, and I actually danced a victory dance. So I ask you today, what is it that makes a ritual? What constitutes a passage in life? I mean, the big ones all seem to have their own music for starters. I mean, who doesn't know happy birthday? 
And who doesn't recognize pomp and circumstances in its connection to graduations? And which of you hasn't hummed the wedding march from Lohengrin? Isn't it amazing that just saying that you can almost hear the music? Apparently music sustains a good ritual, even if the music is just a ship's bell. Of course, one of the most critical elements of these rites is the community in which they are performed and celebrated. As our reading said, it takes a community to realize a ritual celebration. If none of you had showed up this morning, we would probably not have lit the chalice or had music played or sung songs. Community is important. The bride and groom at a wedding would still get married if their guests, guest, if their guests didn't show up, but I don't think it would be the same. There wouldn't be gifts and feasting. It wouldn't really be a celebration, for there had been no witness to celebrate with them. It would have been like raising your hands, their hands in the air and saying, yay, we're married. <laughs> what I had experienced in that automobile sales room was a rite of passage. I was reminded that I had done something momentous, something life-changing in a way, something worth celebrating. I was among a, a community of people who like new cars. I had been transformed from an ordinary traveler to the driver of a queenly carriage and sent on my way in ritual style. That's what rites of passage are all about, celebrating the important things in life. And there are the traditional and popular rites, child dedications, marriage, graduations, memorial services. These are the bread and butter of rituals. These are the big kahunas that define our lives. This mental examination of something we often take for granted has led me to ask more questions and gather a few more answers about the rituals. This morning, I'd like to explore with you some slights of passage, those events that don't usually, we don't usually celebrate with ritual and ceremony, like buying a car. I want to know why we don't. Do we simply lack the imagination to keep large bells in handy locations? Or, or is there something more going on or not going on? A few years ago, my grandson painted the trim on my house. When he was done, he came to me with a big smile on his face, and it made me say, we ought to celebrate. And then we both looked at one another. I mean, we really should, I thought, but I had nothing in mind. So I raised both hands over my head and said, yay, it's finished. And he <laughs> followed suit, and then we said it one more time in unison, and opened two bottles of beer. Well, it wasn't grand, but it was a ritual celebration, sort of. Here then, in my thinking, are some of the elements of rituals of passage that I've cataloged. They're community, celebration, song, witnessing, perhaps dancing, gifts, blessings, and feasting. There are probably even more. And what does the inclusion of any of these elements say in whatever combination they exist? They say, this is really important. Pay attention. This is a transforming experience. This act bears paying careful attention to and remembering. Now, we all know this intuitively and from our experiences, but I, I wanted to lay it out for you in order to better comprehend my next question for you, which is this. What does it say about the life passages we do not celebrate? What about the slights of passage? I want to start this morning by examining a ritual that used to be more important and in some places still is, and in which we as Unitarian Universalists are trying to lift up again. The ritual of coming of age. 
Now, in the Jewish community, the bar and bat mitzvahs still hold a place of real significant ritual, demanding a family gathering, gifts, religious celebration, We've heard of the Native American spirit quest or the Australian walkabout, which are comparable. But all of these belong to indigenous people, not us modern free-thinking people like ourselves. And they're often discounted. Oh, we have coming of age ceremonies in many of our Unitarian Universalist churches, but often they're received with lukewarm enthusiasm by some and often do not extend beyond the walls of the particular church. The first ones, I understand, were done in Kansas City in the mid-70s, and they didn't really catch on until at best 20 or 25 years later. I recall a coming-of-age ceremony where the parents lamented to me that their, par their parents wouldn't come to town for the granddaughter's ceremony, although they made a big deal of her baby sister's dedication. But coming of age to them didn't have the same power, the same scale of celebration in their thinking. And I wonder why that was. I think it's because in our culture today, our children don't really come of age until many years after the original passage into puberty. We keep children as dependents much longer than we did in the past. We educate them for longer periods of time. They live at home much longer. They do not consider marriage until much later in life than they used to. When they really come of age, become ready to stand on their own, they're already fully grown. So we let graduations or weddings take the place of welcoming them into the adult stages of their lives. But I think somehow it diminishes the importance of leaving childhood and taking on that larger set of responsibilities. When we complain that our children don't grow up, we might have to acknowledge that we have slighted their passage into adulthood. Mm. There's another age-related passage I think of often. I have a painting that hangs in my bedroom, and it shows in the background a line of older women looking toward a young woman in the foreground. When I bought it, the artist told me the story about the painting. She said, when I was a young girl and received my first menses, it coincided inconveniently with the coming of my mother's sister from the old country. I was eager to meet my aunt for whom I had been named, but I was feeling a little sorry for myself and hoping she wouldn't notice that I was in discomfort and running to the bathroom more often than usual. So imagine my surprise and embarrassment when my mother, on introducing us, said, Today our Ruthie has become a woman. <laughs> and then imagine my shock when my aunt reached out and slapped me across the face. Before I could react, before I could even cry, she hugged me to her breast and said, Congratulations, Ruthie. May you know no more pain as a woman than my slap on your face. Welcome to womanhood. Sweet story, isn't it? An old-fashioned ritual no longer observed. It was a big deal for, for young Ruthie, and later in her life she painted the welcoming of a young girl into the community of adult women. Because it is a big deal, a life-changing deal for a child to become woman. And we mostly ignore it. I wonder, is it because it's related to sex? Is it because it's about women's power? I don't know. But I think we should be celebrating it for our daughter's self-esteem and for the recognition of them in the communities in which they grow up. At the end of life's ritual spectrum, after weddings and babies, well, all we really have to look forward to is our death ritual. I mean, what does it say to all of us that we do not celebrate the saging, not the aging, of an individual, the coming of age of wisdom? Other societies either do it or have done such a celebration. In the Hindu community is the third age of adulthood after coming of age and becoming a householder, and it is ritually recognized and warmly celebrated. When your duties as a progenitor and a householder and a wage earner are ended, 
You become a person of wisdom and spirit, someone whose life work becomes deepening and sharing. And you are venerated. You are celebrated. You have a reason for living into this advanced age, but not in this society that pretty much still worships youth. Not in this society hey, that I, an elder feel invisible you go out? or muted or shamed. I always hate going to the grocery store to buy a bottle of wine because I don't think some teenager should be able to tell me if I can have a glass of wine with dinner. But once I went and the guy who was, was packing the groceries said to the checker, why do you have to ask her how old she is? She's an old woman. You can tell that. Thank you. <laughs> but it's true. Some women are beginning to take back the honor of saging with rituals of croning, becoming as wise women. In the book Celebrating Our Lives, Edna Ward wrote, as such rituals become institutionalized, their authority develops and gradually reaches out to challenge the rituals or lack of rituals in the wider society. As they continue to speak to a very real and felt need, their power to challenge ageism will increase. But not yet. And not without a parallel ritual for the saging of our wise men. So if the wedding day is the most popular, most expensively celebrated, most universal rite of passage, why the ritual silence around divorce? I mean, we don't like the statistics, half of all marriages ending in divorce. Intellectually, though, we accept that we know that some marriages should be ended. We no longer sh shun the divorcee. But we don't acknowledge this transforming and very real time of passage. You know, I would like to see a healing rite of passage when two people in our community determine it is time to end their union. I see too many people falling out of community because of their divorce. One or the other of them gets custody of the friends, gets the church, or gets the blame. What if we were to develop, to develop a ritual of acceptance for divorce? What if we could support in community two people coming together to accept the decision equally as adults? What if we demanded of them some promises as we demanded vows in their marriage? What if we held them to these? We promise to share the care of our children. We promise to be responsible about our shared assets. We promise that we will respect one another. We promise that we will share our communities of love and support. Think about it. Perhaps then we could be more supportive of them both. I can think, wait a minute, I skipped a page. Don't want to do that. Perhaps there would be less pain, less acrimony, less guilt, fewer misunderstandings, fewer abandoned or emotionally damaged children. If we, as a community of friends and witnesses, supported their decision and took it out of the realm of adversary and shame, perhaps the experience might be more positively transforming more worthy of celebration. Believe me, ritual has a power to it, a political power, a healing power, a social power, and a personal power. The ritual recognition of community and witnesses can be a potent force for good, for support, for affirmation, for healing, for celebration. That is why it is such a travesty when certain populations would, were once denied the ritual of commitment and holy union. It wasn't just that gays and lesbians couldn't get a legal contract for their commitments to one another in most states. It was this denial of community support and affirmation and celebration. It was a travesty of much deeper proportion than was visible on the surface. It was more about the denial of a rite of passage than it was a denial of legal standing. And as we understand rites of passage, that becomes more and more clear. I can think of many other rites of passage, some large, some smaller, that might improve our conditions as human beings living in community. 
I really rather like the daily yogic and monastic rituals of greeting the dawn and the dusk, separating and celebrating each day of our lives. Sometimes when I, I'm dreaming, I think I would like to live in a city like San Francisco, where there are communities of people publicly greeting each day with the movements of Tai Chi together. Wouldn't that be fun? And I know there are communities around here that do it, but not that many. And I was thrilled to discover on a recent early visit to the Japanese gardens in Fort Worth, Texas, where I came from recently, um, that there was a small community that does just that. I've always made it known as a minister that I'm available to do house blessings, but I don't get asked very often. We should know that a house becomes a home through its ritual practices, through learning its idiosyncrasies, through uniting ourselves with its uniqueness. So what keeps us from speeding up and acknowledging that process with a community rite of passage? Well, housewarmings, they're, they're on the right track, but they consist mostly of gifting and not of ritual celebration or blessing. I have a friend who was planning a house blessing for her new home when she bought one, but on her own, she developed a rite of passage to say goodbye to her old house of decades. And she went through each room and recalled some important event that had happened there. And she thanked that room for holding her family in it so generously and so lovingly. She said she lit candles. She hated leaving that old house, but the leaving was healed by her ritual of passage. So if you put your mind to it, you might come up with your own list of slights of passage. Promotions, awards, recognitions, they all deserve their own celebration. Decisions not to have more children deserve their own acknowledgement. Bands should play while new drivers receive their first licenses, and, and maybe then these drivers would remember the importance of this passage and have fewer accidents. Songs could be sung when we lower our cholesterol or blood pressure. And when we come through surg surgery, a physically and emotionally changed person, we shouldn't live our lives in secret as we do. We should meditate more and celebrate more. I have one more suggestion for redeeming a slight of passage, one you probably haven't considered yet. It was given to me by a grief counselor during a minister's retreat. She called it A Ritual for a Happy Death. Strange title, but very effective. I've practiced this ritual for at least 20 years. Each month, I set aside one day or half a day if I'm busy to be alone in contemplation about my life and about my death. I consider the things I may have put off too long. I write to friends. I make telephone calls. I evaluate my possessions and try to accumulate less. I use this day as an opportunity to perform my monthly breast exam because it is a life or death ritual in my family where so many women have had breast cancer. I meditate, and in the Buddhist tradition, I try to contemplate my non-existence so that I'm prepared for it. It's called Wu Wei meditation, no mind meditation. And it's a tradition of stripping the soul of all that isn't essential, meaning all that we will lose at life's end. And it tends to put one's life into perspective. It isn't a morbid ritual. It's a personal celebration of life without the fear of unacknowledged death as a participant. It isn't really like the other rites of passage in that there are no witnesses and no songs, only a modicum of celebration and an anticipation of future transformation. It is a preparation for the final rite of passage to which we will be only nominally invited. We have wedding rehearsals, which to my mind are not very productive, but a rehearsal for that final ritual has come to mean to me a more positive life. We human beings create rituals because life events are important to us. And I hope I've made you con conscious of the process and have encouraged you to create rituals of your own. We make the events of our lives more important in the way that we recognize them. 
So let me finish the story I started at the beginning of this talk. After I celebrated the possession of my new car, I returned to the old one to make sure I had cleaned everything out of it. And I suddenly felt bad about leaving it after all the miles it had carried me along for business and for pleasure, for all the things that it had hauled, all the meals I'd eaten in it, all the stories and songs that had come to me through its radio. So I shut myself in one last time and I said, thank you, you've been a friend. There was no music. I cried a little, and then I said goodbye. That's what life's passages are all about. One door opens, another closes. And we should be present in every passage of our lives. As San Exupere said, we live not by things, but by the meanings of things. And slights of passage tend to rob us of such meaning. So please join me by standing as you're willing and able, singing hymn number 354, We Laugh, We Cry. Let's have a celebration. Sometime alone, but most of all, we need close friends to call our very own. And we believe in life and in the strength of love, and we have found a need to be together. sense of what we find. 
come forward to extinguish the chapel. Our chalice has flamed to acknowledge this weekly ritual of fellowship. Its light is no longer needed for it lives in our hearts. You are the warmth and you are the light. So go your ways, knowing not the answer to all things, yet seeking always the answer to one more thing than you know. So may it be in all our lives. Thank you. Okay.